Well, if you have your Bibles, uh, open, we're in, uh, we're studying through the book of Thessalonians, and we're in the third chapter now, and we're at the end of that, that chapter, verses 11, 12, and 13. And uh, Thessalonians is kind of a typical short book for Paul. You know, the long ones are like Romans and, and Corinthians. <clears throat> but this is typical. Uh, Paul writes uh, four or five chapters. You know, epistles, you know, he's writing back letters. And when you think of them, the letters are kind of long, aren't they? <laughs> I mean, they're not, you know, there's several pages in that thing. So, but um, it's a typical Pauline writing back to churches. Like if you read Colossians or Ephesians or books like that, you'll see that this is pretty much a standard letter. Uh, this book is uh, five chapters, 89 verses. And remember, it was an epistle. It was a letter. He was writing letters back. Uh, to them it's a typical one also there's kind of a theme to this one and I've tried to pound that to get it to you he identifies uh, he opens his heart up uh, pretty good to them and he there are three things that he was concerned about the church uh, theologically uh, that's connected with, with uh, maybe emotions or how, how they were dealing with stress and afflictions. And in chapter uh, 2, in verse 11, if you recall from that, he said, <clears throat> I'm concerned that you be exhorted and um, encouraged and implored. I thought that interesting, that... Um, he, 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 his desire was to get back to them and, and teach them further. He only had three weeks with them. Uh, I guess a lot of people think that, thanks, honey, think that's a long time. And so sometimes when you're involved in, in salvation ministries, Paul thought three weeks was a short time in discipling. I think sometimes... You, you, if you're going to lead people to Christ, you need to disciple them. If you learn anything from Paul, you will learn that. And Paul thought that three weeks, and you know, Paul, he, he held heavy sessions. You know, he wasn't a 30-minute speaker, right? I mean, people would fall asleep, fall out of windows and die, <laughs> uh, if, if you remember that. But... Um, but he's concerned about them, and he would like to be back to be able to teach them and exhort them in the word, encourage them in the word, implore them, exhort them. You know, this was Paul's passion, and, it, and, and he's with young converts. He had to leave them after three weeks, and, and that, well, he hadn't spent nowhere near enough time with them. And so it's kind of an interesting book, and you recall from the third chapter, uh, the outline at the top of your paper... Uh, I broke it down to show you how Paul, what, how Paul's concern was and how he was meeting that concern he had with their need. Uh, and so he's going to return ty, uh, Timothy to him in the first five verses. He, sa he says, I'm sending Timothy. Listen, Pat, Paul is in Athens. And uh, when he went there, he had Titus and he had Timothy and had other guys with him. And when we read about him in Athens, he's alone. He has sent all those guys back to different places to encourage the converts, to disciple them. And Paul says, I'm alone. And so that's kind of interesting. So he sends Timothy back to, to, to get a report and to do them a little further teaching and to get a report on how well they're doing as a young, as a young, a young converts and a very young church. How well they're doing. He's concerned with it because they ran him out of town. The enemy ran him out of town, and, and, they're be, they're, and they are under afflictions and suffering and persecution for the cause of Christ. And so he sends Timothy back, and then in verses 6 through 10, uh, Timothy returns and gives a report to Paul. 
This is what I have seen. And Paul was really encouraged by what he heard because the little church was, going, was doing really well. They were holding their ground. They were standing firm in their faith. Uh, they were not being intimidated. And uh, Paul was, was really thrilled with that. Well, where we are today is Paul's reply to Timothy's report. Verses 11, 12, and 13. Uh, he writes, Now may our God and Father himself and Jesus our Lord direct our ways to you. We expect to get back to you. Uh, think, think how important it was for just a moment. Think how important it must have been to that little church of young converts to have Paul send Timothy, his right-hand man, back to them. Think how important it must have made them feel that Paul would do that for them. Knowing that Paul is out there again on a brand new, on a new mission field. And he's taking his top guy and sent him back for them. Don't you know that must have encouraged them? I'm just thinking in my heart it would have, it would have me. <laughs> it would have me. And so he says, now may our God and Father himself and Jesus our Lord uh, direct our way to you. May the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people, just as we also do for you. Boy, they're spreading love, isn't it? Boy, wouldn't that be good if we could get, get, catch that? This young church had caught that. May the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people, just as also we uh, also do for you. And then he tells you why verse 11 and 12 is important. See the word so that? This is verse 11 and 12 now coming to a, a divine result in Paul's heart. So that he, the Lord, may establish your hearts without blame in holiness. Holiness is, is a word for sanctification. In theology, holiness is a, when you have holiness, holy or holy, if it's holy, it's built, it's a character. If it's holiness, it's, it's what's being produced. I mean, we're told to be holy as God is holy. Think about that. That's a high bar. And uh, he's talking about the character. <clears throat> so he says, that he may establish your hearts without blame and holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all of his saints. And the word saints and the word holy, same Greek word, hagios. A saint is a hagios. Holiness is hagisune. Same, same Greek word, same product. Same, it's the same product. And so, I notice on your paper, I saw in verse 11, 12, and 13, I saw something really important. I saw the word, may the Lord. In verse 11, may the Lord direct our way to you. Notice OPT, that's operative. You very seldom find them in the Greek, and we got three of them in a row. Very seldom you find the operative. I'm going to talk about it in a moment. Verse 12, may the Lord increase and abound love. Notice that? Notice that that's three operatives. One in verse 11, two in verse 12. And then he says in verse 13, may the Lord establish our hearts without blame in holiness. Establishing our hearts without blame, without fault, in holiness, in sanctification. It's, it, it is the outgoing ministry, establishing our hearts, holiness. And holiness is, a, is, is something that's in us that's produced from us. 
Ah, eh, you'll see it. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully you'll see it. So today, what we're going to do, we're going to look at five aspects in my study. What we have in verse 11, 12, and 13 is a prayer of Paul. That's Paul's prayer for him. May the Lord do this. May the Lord do that. May the Lord do that. That's, he, he's telling him, this is what I'm praying for you. This is Paul's prayer for the people. This is Paul's prayer for the people. And so we're going to talk about that today. Notice CAB is church age believers on your paper. And what, what he's interested is that their hearts be established in holiness so that they'll be without blame, without blame at the coming, at the rapture, in our terms, at the rapture. So let's have a word of prayer. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality in the Christian life is personal sin. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3, carnality. Carnality, evidence of carnality is walking in the flesh, gratifying the flesh in your life. Rather than gratifying the lust of the Holy Spirit in you, you're fulfilling the lust. See, it's a choice that you have. You can walk in the Spirit and fulfill the desires and, and the things of God, or you can walk in the flesh and fulfill the desires of your own, of your own will. And that's what you do in personal sin. You do know that. Oh, my, 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 you ought to read uh, James 1, 13 and 14 and 15, for example. Right? He lays it out there just about as, or Romans 13, chapter 13 and 14. These would be great passages for you if, you if you wonder about that. So what do I do to get out of carnality, out of the flesh, and back into the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit? I have to confess my sin. I have to confess my sin. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. Watch this. And cleanse us. You go back to verse 7, 1 John 1, 7. He's already explained cleansing. Cleansing of sin comes by the blood of Christ. Now, when you come to, when you come to the cross as an unbeliever, as an unbeliever, you come because you're under 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin. And what you need is justification. You need the justice of God to remove the 13 judicial charges that have been passed on to your life through Adam. Romans, the fifth chapter, 12 through 21. And the key word for you is justification, the justice of God. When you accept that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead third day, when you believe that for your personal salvation, I'm not talking about head. I'm talking about your heart business. When you personally believe it, that he died for you, that, that he hung on that cross for you if you were the only person on earth. So what you get when you come there is you get salvation. And you get it and you get with that salvation, you get nine works from the blood of Christ in the church age under the new covenant that can never lose in time and eternity. One of those is justification. Like Romans, the whole fifth chapter talks about that. The whole fifth chapter of Romans is about that. But when you come to the cross as a believer, when you confess your sin, the only thing that can only thing that can cleanse you from sin is the blood of Christ. He says that in 1 John 1 and 7. In verse 7, that's what he says. So as a believer, I come back to the cross, not for salvation. I come back as a believer for sanctification, to be restored to the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. That's sanctification. That's I can be set aside in sanctification from the Adam's sin. I'm never going to be charged with the 13 judicial charges ever again. They're removed from my life under the justice of God because of the blood of Christ. And this time I come as a believer because I have personal sin. The only thing that can correct that in my life, the only thing that can correct it 
is the blood of Christ. He died for all sin. One death for all sin. But what I get from it at the cross is sanctification. I get being set apart unto holiness. I get the Holy Spirit, the Holy Bible. These are the things that set me apart from the world. In fact, it's what separates me from much of the church. Unfortunately. Well, anyhow. So, 1 John 1, 9, it, you, you, should, you should deal with that in your own personal life. So, before we start study, because the Holy Spirit, you've got to be, you've got to be in union with the Holy Spirit for him to teach. J John 15, he teaches, John 15 chapter, he te Jesus said he's going to teach you and recall. When he comes to take up residence in your life, his job is to teach and recall the Word of God. So, I'm going to give you a moment of silence. Every head bowed, every eye closed, to offer you privacy. That's your closet. And the first thing you ought to do is allow the Holy Spirit to point out sin in your life. It could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, overt sins. If you're aware of it, you should confess it, name it, cite it, and understand in your heart that the, the Father, because of the blood of his Son, will forgive you you of that sin and won't hold you accountable to discipline. The Father won't discipline you. He won't discipline you. Hebrews 12. Father, we thank you today for your provisions of grace that allow us to confess our sin and the work of Christ on the cross for the forgiveness of sin. Works on my behalf to restore me to sanctification, the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit called spirituality. I pray we would come to understand, if the church could understand that, we could get back on fire. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here we are. The first aspect that I want to bring to your attention. Paul's prayer, that's verse 11, 12, and 13. Paul's prayer is part of what he replies to, and he says, I'm, I'm, I'm going to write on letter what I'm praying for you. I'm praying this over your life, and I'm going to pen it for you. And he writes it down. But this was his prayer for them, and he wants them to know what he's praying for. And he uses, he uses three operatives, aorist operatives, and an aorist, aorist infinitive that has a definite article with it, and that's important. He does this in the Greek language. Very seldom are you going to find an operative. And when you do, it's important for you to understand it because you don't see it often. You would never know that an operative was here if I didn't understand the Greek language, right? You can't see an operative. How do you find an operative? And what, but when you see it, you realize what you have is something really significantly important and operative. Now, listen, I wrote this on your paper, and I'm trying to get you down to what how it, why he wrote an operative, and what purpose would that have in his prayer to them in their need? You know, you pray for people's needs. An operative is used when the idea of the text with the word is subjectively possible. It's a hopeful wish on the part of the person this statement. It's Paul's hopeful wish. So let's, let's look at that. It's his hopeful wish that the Lord would direct our path or our way to you. It is our hopeful wish that the Lord will increase and abound your love like we have for you that you will have for others. And then that's three operatives. And then he moves away in verse 13 to an articular, in other words, a definite article with an aorist infinitive. Now, here's the point that Paul is telling them. Here's the Paul, Paul's I, idea with this. What he is, what he's talking about here is that while it is my hopeful wish that I can get back with you and teach you and love on you and, and encourage you and, uh, and exhort you and employ you in the word, I'm not in charge of that. 
but it is my desire. It is my hopeful wish, but it's going to be the Lord who directs our way. Do you see that? In other words, I have to live under the will of God. It's my will, and it's my desire, it's my hopeful wish that I can get back with you to finish what I started with you. But I don't know what the will of God is right now, right? I've got to follow the will of God. Right now I'm in Athens, and I don't know what my assignment's going to be. I don't know what I'll get back to you, but I want you to know I want to get back to you, and on my end, I want to be with you. For me, I want to be with you, but I don't know if that's God's desire or will for my life at this point, right? We all have that, don't we? See, that's the operative. That's the operative. That's the operative. What Paul, what Paul is saying is that my wish, this is my wish, but the Lord has the final say. The Lord has the final say. Not my will, but God's will be done. But I want you to know my will. I'm stating my will up front. This is my will. Now we'll just see what the Lord's will is. But my will is to be back with you. And, and th that's got to be some encouragement to them too. If, if I possibly get back to you, I want you to know that's a door I'm asking God to open, reopen for me. So that, that again, that's got to be, and listen, here's, and, and listen, remember this is Paul's prayer to them. He's just pinning his prayer down. He said, this is what I'm praying. And he puts it in the operative. This is what I'm praying, but we'll see. I'm laying my will up, I'm laying my will up to the Father. And if he'll, he, he brought me to you one time, I'm hoping he'll bring me to you a second time. But I don't know. Okay. That's, that's what Paul's saying. 1 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, 14 and 15 says that your prayer always has to be according to the will. If it's according to the will of God, he hears it. If he hears it, he answers it. Right? Paul is telling them what his prayerful desire is as he lays his prayer before the Father. But the Father's will has to the Father wills trumps anything you lay up there. Yeah? Paul was pointing them. Uh, then in verse 13, he uses, see the word on your paper, see the word established. It, it has T-O, the word to, that's to. That's a definite article. And, and listen, it's really important when you see an aorist infinitive, if it has a definite article on the front of it, that's a big, big deal. When you study the Greek language, they have, they have one section on how the infinitive works as a present and, and aorist. They have a whole other section in the book that if you add a definite article to it, how it works. It's a big deal. Paul used an articular aorist infinitive, which is not a mood. It's a, it's a verbal noun. It's never classified a mood. You know, like you have a pre present tense, you have a tense and a voice and a mood in the Greek language. The infinitive is not a mood. It's written like it is, but it isn't. It's a verbal noun. It has identity with the verb as a verb, and it has identity as a noun. And you have to pay attention with the context to know where the greatest emphasis is. Is the greater emphasis connected with the noun part of it, the subject and all of that? Or is it connected with the verb? Is it connected with the noun and adjectives? Or is it connected with the verb and adverbs? 
that you have to pay attention to that. When you add the when you add the definite article, it revs it up a great deal. It revs it up. And an aorist infinitive, an aorist infinitive, when you have an aorist infinitive, because aorist is kind of a unique, we have nothing like that in the Greek language, uh, uh, in the English language, but it, it, it's, it's common in the Greek language, but rare in the English. So it's very hard to, but it's a point in time, divorce from time, that's connected with the past, but it's, 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 it's about to be functional in the present. Is connected with the past, and error stands a point in time, divorce from time. The time that is connected with is in the past, but it's brought to it's brought into the presence in order to have an impact. You, we might say history is about to repeat itself. So it, it's kind of a unique, it's kind of unique uh, the way it's used. An aorist infinitive is used to express a specific aim of the action. Of the three uh, operatives, I know that's a lot, but but I just got to tell you how he wrote it. Okay. So when he comes to the infinitive that he's laid out, here's operative one, operative two, operative three. What was the content of his prayer? And it was his desire. But we'll have to wait to see what God wants to do. But it's my desire. I want you to know what my desire is. But I have to wait on the Lord like we all do. If I get back or not, it would be great. I, I don't know. Right? Now he comes down to the infinitive. When he, when, he, when, he, or, when he put a definite article with an aorist infinitive, he's talking about something that he's been connected with in the past was his mission work on the field with something that he's concerned with in the present that he don't know if he can get fixed, but I'm going to send Timothy, and Tim Timothy's come back with a great report. And I don't know how I'm going to keep feeding you the Word of God, but I, I promise you I'm going to do, do the very best I know what to do with it. And so he, when he says in verse 13, so that he may, and this is what he's looking for the Lord to do, so that he, the Lord, may establish your hearts without blame and holiness before God and the Father for the rapture. The eminence of the rapture. I look, look, look. He said, I may not get back to you. My heart is, I want to get back to you. I want to encourage you in your faith. I want to teach you and encourage you in your faith because you've got to put on a full armor of God and you've got to be battle ready every day of your life. But I'm going to pray my prayer. Here's the, here is the bottom line of Paul's operatives that the Lord will establish your heart with what information you have today that the Lord will establish your heart in holiness and hold you there until the, until the rapture comes. And listen, we know, because Paul is going to teach on it in the fourth chapter of 1 Thessalonians on the rapture, he's going to teach on it. That's the rapture, we call it eminent. It could occur at any time. Right? In other words, I'm going to get back to you if it's God's will. And listen, if not, if it not, then here's what we do know. The Lord could beat me there. The Lord in the air could beat me from getting there. Right? And that's what he's saying. So here's my prayer. Because I may not be able to get back. And even, even if there's objects in my way about that, listen, the Lord could come before I could ever get back. Even if I wrote it on my schedule and say, well, I'll be here next winter. I may not. Why? The eminence of the return. So he said, here's what's important. Whether I get back or whether the Lord comes, let me tell you what's important. Here's what you've got to get from what I'm trying to tell you, he says. You've got to let the Lord establish your heart without blame in holiness. Are you with me? You getting any of that? See, my job is to tell you what Paul wrote. And I'm trying to tell you as simple as I know how. Because he wrote, some, he wrote it in really interesting terms. 
He used the operative with an articulate. I know, I know. You go, like, who cares? Just get to the, I know. But I have to, listen, my job is to tell you what he said. Yeah, you do with it what you want. But I'm just telling you how I'm led to do this stuff. Here's point number two. Paul stated his threefold prayer, the threefold prayer, verse 11, 12, 13, his threefold prayer regarding his wish to visit them. And he says three things that are really important in his prayer that he wants the Lord to do, that he believes the Lord will do, that is his desire. And if I, if I was there, this is what I would do, but I can't be there, and so I'm praying the Lord will get this done. You with me? So he says, here's the first thing, that, that, that our God and Father himself and the Lord Jesus, see, what, the Father's the head of the plan and the Son's the head of the church. And they always coordinate on every event. Uh, I don't know. May our God and Father himself and the Lord Jesus direct our way, our path, our road, hodas is road. Look, and what he means by direct, that you will stay on the road, whether there's accidents on the road, whether they're, they're working on the road, <laughs> Rhonda and I took a, a trip up to Pigeon Fork here a while back. And these cell phones, I hate these things, but sometimes they come really important. If you know how to use them, I, I hate them because I don't know how to use them. But we got stalled on traffic. She looked down and she said, there's an accident up ahead. Uh, uh, several miles ahead of us, there's an accident. I said, well, how do you know <laughs> there's an accident? She said, because my phone's red, R-E-D. That means that there's an accident up ahead. It's not road construction. It's not something else. There's an accident up there. Well, we sat a pretty good while. And listen, when we got there, driving by, you know, you eventually get there. Um, I said to Rhonda, uh, take a good look and give me a report because I'm going to keep my hands on, I'm going to keep my eyes on the road and get through this mess we're in, Right? Well, I can't be doing that and doing that, so I'll be over there. <clears throat> and she said, whoa, you're not going to believe this. So I slowed her down to almost to stop. A tree went off the road about 20 yards off a clearing, hit a tree, and listen to me, it split, listen to me, it split the car in half. I thought there was two cars. It split the car in half. I've never seen that in my life. Junkyard. <laughs> but I've never seen it anywhere else. Blankets. Blankets all over the place. And uh, that place was loaded up with police cars and ambulances and whatever you could imagine. Well, the road. When he says, direct, direct our way. May the Lord direct our way. You know, and, and, and that's a true with, with a, no matter what our wish is, his wish is that he could be on the road to back to them. But I don't know because, listen, what's important is that we follow the direct will of God in it. No matter what road we're on, it's all about God's will. No matter what road we're on, it's about God's will. No matter what road you're on, it's all about God's will. It's all about God's will. Even if you have to get up, take a detour. It's all about God's will. The second thing that Paul talked about here that was a, a kind of interesting, and he put them under operatives. In other words, this is what I would be doing with you if I was there. This is what I would be pushing you towards. And he said, you're already involved in it, but I would be going, I would be encouraging you in it. So the second thing he says, that, you, that, that, that may the Lord God cause you to increase, that's growth, and abound, that's, that's spreading it out. Abound. Abound. 
We all would like to have our money invested abound. We would like to have it increase and abound. We would like it to get us 30, 40, or 100 full. And so Paul talks about love this way. May the Lord cause you to increase, to steadily grow, and then abound in love for one another. The word for, ice plus the accusative. When you say ice plus the accusative on my paper, it's directional. The direction for one another and for direction all people just as we also do for you. In other words, we've been an example to you of what I'm talking about. We came in there, we loved you people, uh, we worked with you, we did this and we did that, uh, and, and, and my love for you has increased and abound. And so he uses himself as an example of that. And then in verse 3, may the Lord establish your hearts without blame in the sphere, in plus the locked of, of sphere of holiness. This would be the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit in a life of a believer under what we would call in theology, not positional sanctification, experiential sanctification. This is working in the Christian life out of the Christian life. It's working out it's not working in, it's working out. Point number three. In our lesson text of verses 11, 12, and 13, Paul encouraged the newly converted uh, Thessalonica believers to live the experiential sanctification by establishing what he, when he says, establish your heart's in holiness, this is exactly what he's talking about. See, the word establish is kind of an interesting word. Sterizo. It has the definite article with it. Notice down the, on your paper, so that, that's an accusative, that's, that's an ice plus the accusative, a preposition with an articulate aorist infinitive, which I've described as divine results that he may establish, see there's a definite article to, and sterazo, that's an aorist active infinitive, listen to me, that's an aorist, that's an aorist infinitive, as I mentioned before, with a definite article. And the words sterizo means to set, or to fix, like a broken arm, and you would get it, fi you would get it fixed, they would set it. It means to set. Establish your heart, set your heart into holiness, set it into holiness. That is the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. Listen, listen how this, listen, let me tell you how this is going to work out of your life. If you establish, if you establish your heart, not what you hear, what you believe, not what you hear, what you believe, not what you hear in your mind, what you believe in your heart. When you set your heart in the sphere of holiness, that is experiential sanctification, that is the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. There's two things that's going to work out of your life in this, right? If you want to, if you, if you want to establish your heart in holiness, that's experiential sanctification. Here's, what, here, here, here's going to be it. On the one hand, it's going to be the filling. On the other hand, it's going to be the walking. Be filled with the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 5.18. Walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, Galatians 5.16.17. You know that? That write it on your paper. That write that on your paper. I don't know. If I didn't, you should have. Because you just missed a whole lot of theology. Come on, you didn't write that down. What do you think? What do you think establishing in your heart holiness? 
where holiness is set, set in your heart to fix all the broken stuff in your life. Galatians 5.16, walk in the spirit, will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. These two struggle against one, uh, one another so that you can't do the things you, you ple that please you, that, that, that you will. Ephesians 5.18, you're commanded. It's a present imperative. In Ephesians 5.18, it says, be filled. That's a command. Be filled with the be filled with the dynamics of the indwelling Holy Spirit. You're commanded. That's one of the aspects of establishing your heart in holiness. The word filled is is a play role in Ephesians 5:18. And the best definition for it. It's to fill up a deficiency. The best definition for you, you will find in all of your studies on play role is to fill up a deficiency. <laughs> Look, you walk into a restaurant, you just want a good cup of coffee. Like when I go to lunch today, I want to get me a good, I got one, but I, I've talked and it's gotten cold. I want to get me, and I want to ask them, I want a, I want a fresh cup of good coffee. I'm going to tell fresh. Don't put me no stuff out there. I'm paying, I'm paying good. Isn't coffee expensive today? I eat breakfast at Cracker Barrel. They charge me $2.50 for a, a, a cup. Of course, they keep it filled. But see, I'm old school. <laughs> that almost, I'm almost, the, the part of me says, you need to bring your own coffee here and here. You know, that's part, part of me, that farm boy in me says, like, hey, you, ain't gonna pay. you can buy a whole chicken for that. Hey, we can get eggs and everything off that chicken. <laughs> it's just craziness. All right? So it's a command. It's part of this whole idea. In Galatians 5.16, it says, walk in the spirit. He uses word peripateo in every area of your life. You're to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. In every area of your life. Now, when you're a group of kids, they go like every area of your life, and they start to snicker. <laughs> I say, yeah, even in the bathroom. They go, oh. I don't know who ever thinks about that. But Perry Potato does. But Perry Potato, you put a circle on your paper and put you in the middle, and everything in your life every day is to be under the walking ministry of the Holy Spirit. And let me tell you, that's an imperative in the Greek language. Being filled and walking in the Spirit is how the holy, how you set your heart in holiness and how it works. And they have results. If, for example, if you, and you ought to read all of the chapter 5 of Galatians, and you should read all of the chapter of Ephesians, but in Galatians 5, when it tells you to walk in the Spirit, you drop down a little ways, and it says, and here is the fruit of it, right? If you walk in the Spirit, there's fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, right? I'm saying right like, well, I know it. I don't know if you do, but I'm telling you where you can find it. You ought to read the whole chapter. When you're in Ephesians, the fifth chapter tells you, be filled with the Holy Spirit, you ought to read the whole chapter because it's going to tell you about it. You know, you got to take a little on yourself to do, don't you, people? There are three stages. There are three phases in the plan of God that, establish it, that is able to establish the heart in holiness. Phase one, salvation. That's positional sanctification. Phase two, the Christian life experiential, which I'm dealing with in my lesson. And I've given you a lot of scripture. The fact that you're a saint is positional sanctification. It's one of, status, one of 20 status privileges the moment you believe the gospel that he died for your sins. Hey, I want you to go to Galatians 2.20, and I'm about to wrap this up. Galatians 2.20. 
Galatians 2.20. Every time you see the word you, every time you see the word you, I want you, when you read it, not out loud, but when you read it, I want you to put your name there. Like my name is Ron. Don't put my name there. I put my own there. Galatians 2.20. You can start by putting it with the I. I have been crucified with Christ. Now, who do you think that I is? When you read that, who's that I? It's you. Now, when did that happen? When Christ died on the cross 2,000 years ago, that's the I. He died for you. See, I meet a lot of people in the South. They got head knowledge, but they, they don't have it in their heart because they haven't believed it. They have academically understood that Jesus came to earth and died on a cross, was buried and raised from the dead, academically. They've, they grew up in the church. They've heard it all their life. Unless you see yourself on the cross. I was crucified with Christ. If you don't see yourself on the cross where he died for you, academics won't save you. Faith saves you. You are saved by grace through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift of God. I meet so many kids that understand academically a lot of stuff that have never been saved. And that has been brought to my bold attention by one of my own grand people, my, one of my own grandkids. And as has been, I knew that. I, I work with kids all my life. I've worked with kids. I found it. I was crucified with Christ. It's got to be personal. Listen, your salvation is personal. As it, listen, he, you were on the cross with Christ if nobody else was. And when you come to realize that he died for your sins that separate you from God, was buried and raised from the dead, that's when you get saved. None of this academic stuff. And when I came to Christ, I didn't have any of the academics. I wasn't raised that way. I, I thought Jesus Christ was a swear word. I was told not to use it. And don't talk that way. That's, you're talking naughty. All right. I was shocked when I found out it was a real person. I thought it was a swear word. Listen, I'm not opposed to kids being raised in Christian homes and in the church. I think it's a great thing. But listen, just because they got head knowledge, listen, it's got to be transferred to the heart by faith. This is what he's talking about here. Establish your heart. You never, don't ever have your granny think, well, probably everybody's saved that goes to this church. <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe they grew up in the church and still not saved. What do you think about that? I had a grandchild that way. So I, you know, I was a, got my eyes wide open. Galatians 2.20. Here's what he says. I've been crucified with Christ. Listen, if you have been, there's going to be a change in your life. If you really have been born again, there's going to be a change in your life. If you really have been born again, there's going to be a change in your life. It may be dramatical like mine, or it may be slow like yours because you grew up in the church. But there's definitely going to be a change in your life when, when you realize that Christ died for me and wants to live in me. Watch what he says. 
It is no longer I who live. That's personal. That I is personal. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Lives in me. Has taken up residence, bivouacs. Lives with me. He's not in a separate house. He's not in a separate wing of the house. He lives in me. But Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. See, all that, that's personal. Every bit of that is personal. Every bit of that is personal. Well, you need to go on and read the rest of this. Be, pay, pay special attention to 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 and 14. Uh, that would be important to you. Uh, pay special attention to the words for sanctification. Every time you see the word hagios, it could be hagiosmos or sune. Pay attention to the suffix. Okay? And I wrote them to you. They're really important. The suffix, but I'm out of time. I'm out of time. <laughs> Let me have a word of prayer. We'll take a 15-minute break. You get coffee and donuts and that such is downstairs, and now we'll have the second hour uh, of this lesson. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for these that come our way. We thank you, Father, for the word of God, still alive, powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. It will pierce all the way down to the thoughts and intentions of the human heart, and that is our prayer for it today. I pray, Father, that you would encourage our hearts, encourage us as, as believers in the, in the gospel of Christ and know that our life has been changed and, and it's a good thing. And we're thankful for it every day of our life that, that you've redeemed us and set our feet on a different path and a different road that is based on the will of God. We pray today that we would be open to allowing the Lord to establish our hearts into holiness. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.